Let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come here now just to worship you, to love you, to save you, to grow closer to you, and to know you through your body, which is the church. And we want to just fall deeper in love with your Son and all the people who he has sent to really bless us. We pray that we will bring them to you. And we ask Mary, our mother, Queen of Peace, to just fill our hearts, our souls, our lives with peace and strength and just refresh us. We all need to be refreshed by the Holy Spirit, the water of life. And so we just ask for this special outpouring of this Spirit upon each one of us right now. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, woman, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right, so who's ready for the sacrament of baptism? Okay. First of all, this is the first in a series of sacraments. But what I want to start talking about is how we, we really do enter into the church through the sacrament of baptism. The catechism calls baptism the doorway into the church because this is how we become children of God, adopted sons and daughters of God. And the seven sacraments remind us that the word sacrament means oath, sacramentum. It's an oath swearing that's happening every time we enter into a sacrament. So beginning with baptism, an oath is sworn on our behalf. And confirmation is where we swear the oath ourselves. And every time we receive the Eucharist, we're swearing another oath. And so an oath is when we invoke God's name. We bring God into, into our relationship with him, with each other. And so when we enter into baptism, we're not just entering into God, entering into the Holy Tr- Trinity. We're also entering into a relationship with other people who are already in God. So it's an entering into communion with others as well as the Holy Trinity. And I love what Pope Benedict says when he says, when he talks about making the sign of the cross. He says, when we say that in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it almost sounds like we're doing something on behalf of someone else. Like, I'm here in the name of Kevin. I'm here on behalf of him. But that's not what we're doing. Instead, when we say in the name of, what we're doing is we are entering into the Holy Trinity. He calls it an immersion. We are immersed in the Trinity, the family of God. And he compares it to a marriage. Just as two people, they become immersed in each other through that one flesh union. That's what happens when we make the sign of the cross. In the name of, we, with all our whole being, immerse ourselves into the Holy Trinity, and especially through the sacrament of baptism, which is called a regeneration. It's a regeneration because this is where we are born again, reborn. We are only baptized once, but every time we go to confession, we almost become rebaptized. It's like a a second baptism, but it's not a second baptism. It's almost like, it's more like a resuscitation. We are reborn once, but the sacrament of confession is a resuscitation because we can die. We can lose God's grace. We can fall outside of God's justice. And so the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what we receive through water. And what I would like to do is just talk a little bit about some of the things that Pope Benedict XVI mentions when he talks about baptism and the renunciation of evil and, the, um, and also the water as well. The water in baptism is important. Why water? Any kind of water will do as long as it's predominantly water. So, you know, melted ice will do. Steam that turns into water, that kind of water will do. Um, obviously, salted water will do. Any kind of water, as long as it's predominantly water, will do for baptism. And the reason why water is so important is because of what it represents. It represents death, and it also represents life. You see this especially in Noah, and the flood is a type of baptism because it's a new creation. And so just as in the beginning, when you, in the beginning of the book of Genesis, you hear that in the beginning that there was a darkness and a void. Well, that represents original sin, but then there's the, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God hovered above, and then... All of a sudden, there is water, and there is a creation. 
And so, because of sin, God sent a flood. And so that represents a new creation, that represents a new baptism. And not only is it Noah, but also when God delivered the Hebrews out of slavery, out of slavery represents sin, original sin. And where did he take them? He took them through the Red Sea, again, which represents new life. But there was a death that happened as well, the death of the Romans, the death of the Egyptians, the, um, the Pharaoh and his soldiers. So there's a death and then there's a life. And you also see that in the Jordan as well, where Joshua took his people over through the, the river as well. And all this is mentioned when a baptism occurs. It's all part of the baptismal rites. <coughs> now what Benedict the Sixteenth says in mention of the pomps. So this is what Pope Benedict the Sixteenth says. I'm just going to read it. It's quite, quite a bit of it, but it's interesting. There is, first of all, the right of renunciation and the promises. In the early church, the one to be baptised turn towards the west, which is a symbol of the darkness, the sunset, death, and of course the dominion of sin. And then what happened was, as the person turned towards the west, renouncing this evil, this sin, he pronounces a threefold no to the devil, to his pomp, and to sin. And Pope Benedict says, the strange word, and it is a strange word, the strange word pomp, that is to say the devil's glamour, referred to the splendour of the ancient cult of the gods and of the ancient theatre, in which it was considered entertaining to watch people being torn limb from limb by wild beasts. What was being renounced by this no was a type of culture that ensnared man in the adoration of power, in the world of greed, in lies, in cruelty. It was an act of liberation from the imposition of a form of life that was presented as pleasure and yet hastened the destruction of all that was best in man. That's the same to today, isn't it? Everything that we consider that is best for man as far as pleasure is actually his own destruction, downfall. And so that's what pomp is. It's this pleasure that is found within in something that's so destructive. And this renunciation, Benedict says, albeit in less dramatic form, remains an essential part of baptism today. We remove the old garments which we cannot wear in God's presence. And then Benedict talks about how you would turn then from the east, from darkness to the west, to light, to the rising sun, which represents, of course, the rising Christ. And he says, the, king, the candidate for baptism determines the new direction in his life. So you can see how a conversion really is a turning, a changing of direction. And that's what that represents, a turning from darkness into light. And I like that because that's an experience. That's not just some lip service. I wish we did that today. There's a lot of lip service today in the church when it comes to baptism. Do you reject yes? Do you reject yes? Why are you here for faith? It's, it all becomes very formulaic, which that is a real experience of turning, recognising that darkness is real, sin is real, evil is real, the devil is real. And when you turn to the east, you, re, you are recognising that God is real, the sun is real, Jesus is real, there is a light. And that's why baptism is not just a regeneration where you are born in, into God's family, you are born again, but it's also an illumination. And that's why once you are baptised, the parents of the baptised child receive the candle, the paschal candle, because you have been illuminated now. The person baptised is illuminated and enlightened with the truth. So it's a, it's a regeneration and an illumination. And so Benedict says, In the early church, the candidate for baptism was then truly stripped of his garments. He descended into the font and was immersed three times a symbol of death that expresses all the radicality of this removal and change of garments. His former death-bound life, his former death-bound life, the candidate consigns to death with Christ, and he lets himself be drawn up by and with Christ into the new life that transforms him for eternity. And then he talks about the importance of the white garment, which is where we put on Christ. And of course, it's a symbol of impurity. And then he goes on to explaining the renunciations. There are three enunciations. 
And he says, I shall take the second one first. The second renunciation is, do you reject the glamour of evil and be refused and refuse to be mastered by sin? Benedict asked the questions, what is this glamour of evil? He says, in the early church and for centuries to come, the words here was, do you renounce the devil and all his works, the vain pomp and glory of the world? And we know today what was intended by these words. The pomp of the devil, above all, the pomp of the devil, meant the great bloody spectacles in which cruelty became amusement. Today, that's so true, isn't it? Cruelty today is a form of amusement. That's why it's posted so much on the internet, on YouTube especially. In which killing men became something to be watched. A show, the life and death of a man. These bloody spectacles, this amusement of evil is the pomp of the devil in which he appears with seeming beauty. But in fact, with all his cruelty, of course, because he's a fallen angel, angel of light, in which he appears with seeming beauty, but in fact with all his cruelty. However, beyond this immediate meaning of the phrase pomp of the devil, there was a wish to speak of a type of culture, a way of life. So this being entertained by evil in those days, especially for um, during the time of the Colosseum, that wasn't just a sport, that wasn't just an activity, but that was a way of life, that was a culture. And so what the baptised person would be turning away from when he renounces the pomp of the devil, he's renouncing that culture, that way of life, that, that um, darkness. And then Benedict says, in, in fact, being baptised means essentially being emancipated, being freed from this culture. Today, too, we know a type of culture. Of course, Pope John Paul II talked about the culture of death. We need the gospel of life because we are in the midst of the culture of death. And so Benedict says that we need to be freed from this culture in which truth does not count. Even if apparently people wish to have the whole truth appear, only the sensation counts and the spirit of calumny and destruction. It really is sensation and feeling is all that counts today. It's not about truth. Um, as long as you avoid suffering at all costs and you experience some kind of pleasure, even to the destruction of self, even to the destruction of others. You know, that's why you see so many people sleeping together. It's because they're using each other for their own pleasure. Mm -hmm. That's not love. They're not putting their other person's soul before their own body. They're putting their own body before their other person's soul. That's why it's um, so destructive. And then Benedict switches to the first renunciation. Do you reject sin so as to live in the freedom of God's children? And Benedict says, today, freedom and Christian life is the observance of the Ten Commandments. Very simple. But of course, today, those, even the Ten Commandments are outdated, aren't they? That are moded. Um, and then lastly, we, the question is asked at baptism, do you reject Satan? This shows that Satan, how many times do we hear Satan ever preached? It seems like it's only at a baptism, but it, even then it's like very quickly. Like, let's get through it quickly. It's, it's as though there's a fear of mentioning the, the fact that Satan exists. Satan is real, Satan exists. How can you take God seriously if you've got no real understanding that darkness is you know all consuming when we need to be consumed by the all consuming light then the confession in three questions do you believe in god the father the almighty creator of heaven and earth in christ and lastly in the holy spirit and the church and then he talks about the importance of water and now you see it in the old testament and it also becomes a symbol of the cross it's united to the cross of course, you see the spear going into Jesus' side, pierces his heart, and now comes blood, Eucharist, and water, which also symbolises baptism. And so you can see the importance of death right there in order to bring about new life. And, and then he talks about the importance of oil for the catechumens. In baptism, the priest uses the oil of catechumens, which is olive oil, and chrism, the latter being a mixture of balsam and oil, these oils are consecrated by the bishop on Monday, Thursday, and the anointing in baptism is recorded by <coughs> St. Justin, St. John Chrysostom, and other ancient fathers. Pope Innocent I declares that the chrism is to be applied to the crown of the head and not to the forehead, um, for the latter is reserved to the bishops. 
And the triune name is what's so important in this because, again, Pope Benedict says that we don't be, I don't become a Christian because of anything I do. Instead, God comes to me. It starts with God. It doesn't start with me. You know, as non-Catholic Christians, they don't believe that. They believe that I accept Jesus into my life as my Lord and Savior, so I have to say yes. So it's me, really. But it, Benedict says, no, it starts with God. It doesn't start with us. And so no one can say, I became a Christian myself. Instead, God entered into you, and then he drew you to himself. And that's what happens in baptism. So that's why when somebody, if you ask a non-Catholic, you know, when did you become a Christian? They'll say, oh, I chose Jesus when I was about 15, 16. But if you ask a Catholic, we should say at our baptism, because that's when God came into us. And Benedict says that life in this world wasn't our decision. I didn't choose to be born. That's a gift from God. And so my rebirth is even much more of a gift from God, because this is, uh, this is eternal. So it's a gift. And the word baptism actually comes from the Greek word baptizio, which means, or baptizo, which means to immerse or to pour. And so the early Christians, they would be stripped completely naked when they went into the water, and then the water would be poured over them. And the formula would be, in the name of, I baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they would go down three times, up, down. And the, the entering into the water would represent the death, the burial with Jesus, and the rising out of the water would represent the resurrection of Jesus. And it's important that it's done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because this is who God is. I remember not too long ago, there was a group of Catholics who were baptizing people in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. And Pope Benedict stepped in and said, no, that isn't valid, because that's not who God is. That's what God does. There's a difference. We are being baptized into his being when we are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so the catechumen would enter into the water naked. And that's exactly what we're supposed to be before God. We're supposed to be naked. We're supposed to be vulnerable. But typical English, because of this cold weather, we know how to wrap up. We know how to put layers on. When God is asking us to strip off, I'm not talking physically, obviously. <laughs> strip off before you come to church next week. But we are being asked to strip off spiritually instead of adding all these different layers. And why do we add layers? When you look at the crucifixion, Jesus was stripped off completely naked. In baptism, they were stripped off completely naked. And in our faith, we're told to be naked before God because guess what happens when we die? We stand naked before God, completely vulnerable, totally exposed. And we can't hide behind anybody. We can't make excuses. This, this is truth facing us and we have nowhere to run. So we're going to be naked in the next life. We better, we might as well start stripping now. <laughs> start stripping now. Um, I, I always think about Florida when I worked in it over there, how hot it was and how, much, how miserable I was because it was so hot and humid. And there's only so many layers you can take off. And being pasty white in English, I would burn, I'd burn like a match. So I would burn like a match. And it made me miserable. And so the first thing you do when you get back home is, oh, cold, rain, brilliant. Um, but then the layers start coming back on. But we need, to, we need to have that kind of vulnerability where we do experience God's fire. So we do burn. Because what God wants to burn from us is everything that doesn't belong there, you know, whether it be sin or the wounds of sin. But that's hard. It's hard to just let go. It's hard to be vulnerable. We want to do this when Jesus taught us to do this. And how do we do this? How do we stretch our arms out so that our hearts become fully exposed? That's what it is. But it's hard when we have so many wounds. And it, become, it comes down to trust. That's what it's all about. How much do we really trust God with our lives? Do we trust God 90%, 99%? Do we give him 100%? The prayer that we should have, really, is God, I want to give you 100%, but there's something in me stopping me, so you need to do something about that because I don't know how. That's, that's what I pray. 
and I don't know how else to do it. I don't know how honest I can be other than say, God, I want to give you 100%, but there's something stopping me. And if I don't give you 100%, if I give you 99%, I know Satan only needs 1%, and he'll use that against me. So I need God's help. And that's where we have so many graces within the church, especially the sacraments. Pope Francis said that the sacraments is where we encounter Christ. We encounter him in the sacraments. Because it's through the sacraments that God pours his own life into us. Beginning with baptism. We immerse ourselves into him who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And, if, and Jesus didn't ask, doesn't ask us to do anything he never did. What's the very first Jesus, thing Jesus did when he began his public ministry? Baptism. And John said, it's I who needs to be baptised by you. Jesus said, no, this is how it needs to be right now. And it's at that moment that the sacrament of baptism began. And what do we see? We see the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit coming down. And the last thing Jesus did, the first thing Jesus does in his public ministry, baptism. The very last thing Jesus does after his resurrection is to the apostles, preach to all nations, baptising in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now the Catechism teaches that there's three different types of baptism. You have baptism of water, which is the true sacramental baptism. And you also have sacrament, uh, the, the baptism of blood, which is where, if you don't have water, but you do love God, you are repentant of all your sins, and you do die for your faith, then you are baptised. And then there is also the baptism of desire which is where you truly love God above all things and you have true contrition of heart and again there's no way you can be baptised any questions so far? Yeah I'm saying when you say strip yourself isn't it stripping yourself of your bad habits that you've grown yeah. and you know yeah bad habits and I think sometimes we can only strip ourselves so, so far where we, have, where we need God to say okay I need you to help me now it's almost like again it comes down to trust we can give so much of ourselves to God but there's something always stopping us from just giving that little bit more and I think sometimes I know for me what stops me from giving God 100% all the time is because I've seen what he does with people who we call them saints, and boy, did they suffer. <laughs> I don't want to suffer. <laughs> and so that's what puts me off. I'll give you 100%, but I don't want to suffer, especially like the way the saints did. And, but they gave 100%. And what they gave to God, God always gave more than they could ever give him. And that's what he does for each one of us. Maybe not in this life, but certainly in the next, we will always get more um, than what we are able to give. And that's what's powerful with God, because... We don't deserve anything. He doesn't owe us anything. And yet he, he gives us everything. He, you know, he gave us everything in the beginning. And then, as you know, it's through the first sin, which Adam and Eve committed. That's when, that's the original sin. Um, and so he could have easily said, right there, I gave you everything. That's the end, no more. But instead, not only did he give us the prophets not only did he give us the old testament not only did he give us many teachers but he gave us his only son to die for us if that's not love then what is and not only did jesus die for us and ascend into heaven for us but then jesus goes and gives us the holy spirit and that's what we receive in baptism and so it's it's through that death with jesus and that rising to new life now we are free to allow the trinity to enter into us because if jesus didn't die we're just sin and the, the holy spirit cannot enter into sin god is too pure so that sin has to be taken out in order for the trinity to enter in and that's where the death of jesus came in he took upon himself our sins so that we could be united to his death and be and raised with him to new life and then we receive the spirit for me that's just one sacrament you know we got we have six more to cover but what a sacrament the doorway into the church the entrance into god his own divine name and then you know when we're old enough we have to make that decision ourselves to live out and to experience the gifts 
that we're given in baptism. And so these gifts that we're given in baptism then lead to fruits. And so that's confirmation. And then, of course, what better gift could we ever receive? What better fruit could we ever receive than the Holy Eucharist at Mass? And so you can see how each sacrament just is just an entrance into the, the deeper essence of who God is so that we can become God in this world. And that's because of the sacraments. Now, there's a word that is used in the Catechism called, you might have heard this, it's a fancy word, ex opere operato. Anybody heard of that? Oh, this is it. This is the meaning of the church's affirmation that the sacraments act ex opere operato, which means by the very fact of the actions being performed by virtue of the saving work of Christ accomplished once and for all. What that means is, ex opere operato, by the very act of the action being performed, it means it doesn't depend on the holiness of the person. It's the very fact that um, there is a, in the case of baptism, there is a formula and there is the matter. There's the form and then there's the matter. And the form is, I baptised you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is done through water. So when those two actions occur, and it doesn't have to be a priest, it doesn't have to be a bishop, it doesn't even have to be a Catholic, and it doesn't have to be a believer. Because it's the word and the matter which is united and ordained by Christ to act in that way so that when that happens, that person enters into eternal life and who is reborn. Isn't that comforting to know that in the case of an emergency, anyone can be baptised? Anyone can baptise? I'm not really sure how this works. Maybe it's because I'm a man. But what I read is also, in the case of an emergency within the womb, a baby can be baptised because of the water. As long as it's like there's a, some kind of a pouring over the baby within the womb. Now, the baptism of desire only works on the person who is um, of consent. It doesn't. Only, if you're not of consent, engage. Then, um, if you're not of age of reason, is what I'm trying to say. Then you can't receive the baptism of desire. It's only the baptism of water to be prior to that. Anyway, if you can take all your sheets. And we'll begin by just talking about scripture references which talk about baptism. If you go down to the last three questions, that way you won't have to read it all over again to answer them. We'll just look at the first three questions and then we'll put you into groups to answer those questions. So the first one is, which is your favourite paragraph here and why? The second one is, what do you think Jesus meant in John chapter 3 verse 8, which is at the top? And then the last one, do you know anyone who receives God's kingdom like a child? Anyway, so the very first um, paragraph, John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after growing old? Can one enter a second time into the, mother, the, womb, the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, You must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. 
These three verses, these three paragraphs are actually used when a baptism takes place. Um, so that's why I put them in there. Because this is actually what's used and then the priest gives his homily during the baptism. And then after that, that's when you begin to hear the profession of faith. And then you, you also hear the renunciation of um, Satan as well. Matthew 28. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so as soon as the early church started, that was what they were doing. They went out baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then the next one, Mark 1. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart. The word torn in the Greek there is schizo. It's where we get the word schizophrenic, torn mind. And so here, the, the heavens are torn open. The next time you hear the word schizo, and the only time you will hear the word schizo is when Jesus is on the cross. He breathes out his spirit, and that's when the temple veil was torn in half. It was the torn schizo. It was ripped in half. To represent that there's now no separation between God and his people, because that's what the veil represented. The Holy of Holies in the temple and the people. And so now the temple veil is torn because now the temple of God, which is Jesus, true temple of God, has been crucified. But then he gives us his spirit, so now we become temples of the Holy Spirit. Sacrament of Confirmation. It's great to be welcomed with the songs of the Holy Spirit, especially for this sacrament, because as we know, this sacrament is about the infusion of the Holy Spirit within our own souls. I'd like to begin by asking a question, and the question is, what are you struggling with as spiritual people? What are we struggling with? What is this spiritual battle we're in? Just throw out what your struggles are, and I'll just write them on the book. Or maybe not your struggles, other people's struggles. Mm. How's that? Mm -hmm. That way you don't have to treat this as a confession. Fear. Fear. <coughs> Anything else? What else are you struggling with? Patience. Patience. Sorry? Doubt. Doubt. Anything else? What are you struggling with? Pride. Pride. I don't like that one. <laughs> pride. I think it's Aquinas who says pride is disordered self-interest, which basically means you think yourself <coughs> better than what you really are. <laughs> Sorry. Lack of courage. Lack of courage. Anything else? Tolerance. What are you struggling with? Sorry? Tolerance. Tolerance. Sorry, somebody shouted. Scruples. Scruples. What? Scruples. Yeah. Selfishness. Isn't it great doing this? Because you can either you can all relate now. Everybody's like this. It's not just me. <laughs> Selfish. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm put that top of the list. <laughs> Exhaustion. <laughs> Anything else? Anger. Anger. It's funny, when someone says exhaustion, they sound exhausted. When someone says angry, they sound angry. Pain. Somebody said pain. Pain. It's amazing how fast they all came out at once, like a machine gun. It's like all of a sudden, now there's nothing. The devil. Oh gosh, the devil. Anything else? Temptation. Temptation. But I think, as I'm doing this, I'm, remi I'm being reminded as well about what the Catechism says, that the three temptations that we face... Are anybody know? Are the world, the flesh, and the devil. So that pretty much sums up everything we've been looking at. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, rather than just go through confirmation like, um, like a, you know, a theological paper, I thought, just ask the question, what does confirmation really have to do with me? How is it helping me in my life? And it comes down to struggling. That's what confirmation is there for, to help us in our struggles. Because the word confirmation comes from the Latin word confirmare, which means to be firm 
In other words, to have strength. So you could call it the sacrament of confirmation. You could also call it the sacrament of strength. To give us strength against all of these things. And that's what, that's what the whole purpose of confirmation is. With this outpouring, special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit come the seven gifts. And the seven gifts are there to conquer all of these struggles. And so you have the gift of strength. The gift of fortitude, which is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You have the gift of piety, which is a good gift to battle pride. It keeps you humble. You have the gift of counsel, which helps you to be kind. It also helps you to know what God's plan is for your life. It helps you to be patient. You have the gift of knowledge, knowledge which helps you to know God and know your own limits, your own weaknesses and your own dependence on him. You get the gift of understanding as well. And that, again, helps you to be more kinder and sympathetic. And it kind of takes away things like envy. Because if you really understand why people are the way they are, then you're not going to want what's bad for them anymore. The reason why we might want what's bad for people is only because we don't understand them. There's something that we, there's a disconnect. And so if we want to really love people, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit... If we want to truly love people, then we have to really understand them. I was talking to somebody a while ago about how we are called to see Christ in one another. And I gave the example of Mother Teresa and, you know, the famous Bible passage, I, whatever you do to the least of these, my brothers, you do to me. And I was asked, well, how do you do that with people that you don't really know or like? And my response was, you get to know them. That's how you love people that you don't know, is you have to get to know them. You have to really unpack who they are and why they are the way they are. And I think the more you do that, the more you end up just having empathy for them rather than envy. And, and so we have the world, the flesh, and the devil. And last week we talked about baptism and how baptism really is a rebirth out of this world and into the triune God into God himself and Jesus said that we are in the world but we are not of the world and the most my favorite line he concludes with is do not be afraid because I have conquered the world so we do have a lot of fear and we do have a lot of struggles and a lot of it really is worldly but Jesus said do not be afraid for I have overcome the world and a lot of it as well as our own flesh because of original sin and baptism is there to take away original sin, but what's left behind are the effects of original sin, concupiscence, which we've looked at before. And so in Romans 7, St. Paul talks about how there is a law within me which seems to dominate my will. And he says it's the law of sin. And what am I to do? It's as though the flesh wants to do one thing and my soul wants to do another. And I know the truth. So how, how can I overcome this law of sin? And he ends by saying, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. And then we have, of course, the devil. And when the devil fell, where did he fall? He fell here, to the world. And so not only did he fall to the world by him, he didn't fall to the world by himself. When he was cast down, he brought a third of the angels with him. And of course, there are countless numbers of angels, which means a third of however that many is, is going to be a lot. But we have nothing to feel because Jesus came to destroy the devil. And so as long as we are faithful to God, then we will be strong in the world, we will know how to overcome the flesh and be led by the soul, and we'll have everything we need to fight the devil. The secret is faithfulness and <coughs> trust and the Holy Spirit. Any questions? Now what I can do is talk about the word sacrament, mainly because I've talked about it before. <coughs> but I'm going to ask some questions. When you hear the word sacrament, what do you think of? If somebody used to say, what is a sacrament? What kind of words might you use to describe it? A help. A what? A help. A help. I thought you said a herb. A help. Help. Anything else? Help. What is a sacrament? Holiness. Holiness. What else? What is a sacrament? A gift. A gift. What else? Sacrament. 
Somebody said, what is a sacrament? The first thing you think of is... You know what Pope Francis says about sacraments? He says it's how we encounter God. It's an encounter with Jesus Christ. Because it's how God has chosen to give us his own life through the sacraments. And the sacraments are composed of two things, form and matter. And the form has everything to do with the words spoken by the priest or the person administering the sacraments. So baptism, anybody could, in an emergency, administer the gift of sacraments. And the matter, in the case of baptism, becomes the water. In, sacram in the sacrament of confirmation, it will become the laying on of hands and also the chrism oil, as well as the words. And so the form is the words because the words are powerful. Because when Jesus speaks, the book of Isaiah says that the words of God do not return to him empty. So in the beginning, there was a darkness, a formlessness, and the Spirit hovered over the deep. That reminds us of original sin. Because what comes next? God said, let there be light. And in baptism, original sins take away. And then that person is illuminated with the truth. So there is a light. And that's why that, person, that child or adult being baptised is then given a candle to represent that child is now filled with the light. And so, right there in the beginning of the book of Genesis, when you see that there's this darkness, this formlessness and this void, this original sin... You also hear how God said, and then the Spirit. So you have God the Father, you have Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God, because God said, and then you have the Holy Spirit. So you have the Trinity right there, and then you have the water, and then you have, which is the matter, and you have the form, which is the Word, God said. And when God says, that Word does not return to him void, there was light. And so you see that throughout the whole of Scripture. When Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth, he rises from the dead. When Jesus says to the blind man, receive your sight, those, return, those words did not return to him void. When Jesus holds up the, the host and says, this is my body, this is my blood, those words do not return to him void. And so when whoever's doing the sacrament of baptism says, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those words do not return void. And that person is baptised in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as Pope Benedict says, to be baptised in his name is not just to be a representative of him, it's to immerse yourself completely in him. That's what it means to say, in the name of, I'm immersing myself in his name, in who he is. And that is shown also in the Sacrament of Confirmation, with the words, be sealed with the Holy Spirit and so it's a sealing and we also get that sealing as well in baptism that's why there's only one baptism that's why there's only one confirmation um, you never need to be reconfirmed there's only one because you are sealed with the Holy Spirit and so sacraments not only is the form there's matter there's words and there's water this happens because of what we mentioned last week ex opere Operato. And that means, ex opere operato means by the very fact of the action being performed, which means it doesn't depend on the holiness of the person, it doesn't depend on what kind of a person it really is. So a priest, during the act of consecration, you know, he could be one of the world's worst sinners, but because of the words and because of the matter, the bread and the wine, those two united together at the same time in that moment, they truly become the body of blood of Christ because it's God who's doing it. And so that's the same with the sacrament of confirmation and baptism. That's the same with all seven sacraments. You know, two people in a wedding, they're facing each other. They could be the biggest sinners in the world, but that word, I do, is what gets them married. That's the power of words. Words are very powerful. And so... Ex opere operato. And one last thing about sacraments as well. We've looked at before how it means to swear an oath because it's how we enter into this covenant relationship with God. And it's also described as a sign, not just any sign, it's an efficacious sign. 
efficacious. So, in other words, it's effective. A good example is a traffic light. A traffic light is not efficacious. If a car stops there because it's red and the light turns to green, that car doesn't have to move. It can stay where it is. Or if a car is driving towards the light and all of a sudden it changes from green to red, the car can still go through. It doesn't affect the car. It's a sign, but it doesn't affect. Whereas baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, all seven sacraments, when those words are said, it's efficacious, it affects, it has within it what God has ordained it to be, which is to bring about this grace, this sanctifying grace. Right, what I'd like to do now is on your pieces of paper, if we can take hold, just read through the catechism of the Catholic Church. This is what it teaches when it comes to the Sacrament of Confirmation in Article 1302. It is evident from its celebration that the effect of the Sacrament of Confirmation is the special outpouring of the Holy Spirit as once granted to the Apostles on the day of Pentecost. From this fact, confirmation brings an increase and deepening of baptismal grace. It roots us more deeply in the divine filiation, which means sonship, the divine filiation, which makes us cry, Abba, Father. It unites us more firmly to Christ. It increases the gifts of the Holy Spirit in us. It renders our bond with the church more perfect. It gives us a special strength of the Holy Spirit to spread and defend the faith by word and action as true witnesses of Christ, to confess the name of Christ boldly and never to be ashamed of the cross. Recall then that you have received the spiritual seal, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of right judgment and courage, the spirit of knowledge and reverence, the spirit of holy fear in God's presence. Guard what you have received, God the Father has marked you with his sign. Christ the Lord has confirmed you and has, take, and has placed his pledge, the Spirit, in your hearts. Like baptism, which it completes, confirmation is given only once, for it too imprints on the soul an indelible spiritual mark, the character, which is the sign that Jesus Christ has marked a Christian with the seal of his Spirit by clothing him with power from on high, so that he may be his witness. This character perfects the common priesthood to the faithful, received in baptism, and the confirmed person receives the power to, preserve, to profess faith in Christ publicly, as it were, officially. Any words stand out for anybody in there? Right, so the words that stood out for me are battle, seal, and... Of course, we've been looking at the word sacrament, which comes from the Latin sacramento, to swear an oath. And the reason I bring them up is because what sacrament of confirmation does for each one of us, it makes us soldiers for Christ. And that's why the word battle stands out, because St. Paul tells us that the battle that we are in is not against anything physical in this world. It is against the spiritual and the reason why seal is important is, and sacramento is important as well, this swearing of an oath, is because it goes right back to the time of the Roman Empire. Before the Christians actually used the word sacrament, the Roman soldiers were using it. They used it in order to enter into the legion, enter into the army. They had to swear an oath. They had to swear a sacramento. And once they did, they were sealed, they were branded. And so this branding hot red hot iron on the skin showed you who you really belong to you're not fighting anymore for yourself you belong to someone else you're fighting for someone else and it wasn't just romans who received this it would be slaves as well they would be given the seal they would be property for the masters you might have seen the gladiator you see the seals there then they receive a seal a seal and so they are branded and that's what happens to us. We become soldiers for Christ. And so the seal that we receive is not a physical one. It's a spiritual one because the battle is a spiritual battle. And the oath that we are entering into is an oath of family. That's why baptism is entering into the family of God. And then confirmation gives us the strength to stay in that family. 
And as you said before, with all the lists that we put up there before, it is tough. Every single day we are facing so much. We are facing doubts. We are facing exhaustion. We are facing the devil. We are facing the world, the flesh. We are facing temptation. We are facing envy and impatience and pride. And notice all these things are things that you don't really see. But you know they're there. The demons and the devils you don't really see, but you know they're there. The Holy Spirit, you know it's there. Like a breeze. In fact, the word um, spirit in the Greek, pneuma, means wind. And last week when we looked at baptism, Nicodemus says, what do I have to do to get get into heaven? And Jesus starts talking about how the wind blows wherever it chooses. You don't see it coming, you don't hear it. And so that's the same with the battle that we're in. You don't always see it coming, but you know it's there. And in hindsight, I don't know about you, but with me, in hindsight, that's when I know I've had a spiritual battle. It it takes a lot of experience to really see it coming and then recognise it's there. But when you haven't experienced it, you'd only see it afterwards and you look back and you think, what was wrong with me? What happened? How, How did I go through all of that? It must have been something spiritual because it wasn't something physical. And so the gifts of the Holy Spirit are there to strengthen us. But we have to know what those gifts are so that we can hold on to them, cling on to them. And something that I've been starting to say, thanks Peter Miles, is the breastplate of St. Patrick. Because that's something powerful as well. So I definitely encourage everybody to say that when they get up. And again, remembering St. Cyril of Jerusalem, who was a bishop of Jerusalem in the fourth century said, make the sign of the cross, it's an exorcism. So we got our weapons, and St. Paul tells us what those weapons are. The helmet of truth, there's a blessed breastplate, the sword, which is the word of God. So we have the truth, we have the word of God, we have the sacraments, which is God's grace. We have everything we need, and yet look how exhausted we are. It's true, isn't it? We have everything in the church. We have all the saints, we have a guardian angel, We have Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit, we have God the Father, we have Mary our Mother, we have each other, we have the Holy Eucharist, the body, blood, soul and divinity poured into into our veins. You'd think we'd be a little bit stronger, (laughs) you'd think it'd be a little bit easier. But no, um, Padre Pio, when you look at his life, the amount of suffering he has, he has equal the amount of grace. Because when we are weak, then we are strong because that's when it's God in us. So it's not a bad thing that we're exhausted. It means we're doing something right. If we weren't tired, then that means we're doing something wrong because the devil has left us alone. He doesn't need to tempt us. We look at a lot of criminals and murderers. You know, they're very happy people. The devil's left them alone. They don't. What, the, what does the devil need to bother them for? They're already doing his work. But it's... You know, you read the lives of the saints, they're exhausted, they're shattered, they're knackered, they're drained, they're suffering, they're in pain. But there's a peace in there as well because they know they're doing it for God, but they know they're doing something right. Because when you're tired and you're, you're, you're going through this spiritual battle, you know you're doing something that the devil doesn't want you to do, which is to be faithful. And I think in the middle of all of this, whatever sufferings, whatever struggles and temptations, it all comes back to love. It's, a, it's almost like the, the real fight that we're in, whether you say you're struggling with pride or obedience or whatever, the real struggle we have is love. That's what it comes down to. Even if you say I'm struggling with forgiveness, it's love. Love is to want what's best for the other, even if it means at your cost, your sacrifice. St. Paul says that you have to treat other people as better, as more important than yourself. I don't like it, not because I don't want to do that. It's just because it's so hard. I mean, maybe, you know, I'll do it next week. I'll do it tomorrow. But, you know, he's not talking about a one-off. It's something that you have to do with everybody and you have to do it all the time. You have to die to yourself, and that's tough. I was listening the other day to a talk by Marino Restrepo, 
And he was talking about let go and let God, dealing with wounds. And it was a good talk because he's talking about how with our wounds, what you're really asking for when you're asking to be healed is you're asking for strength, is you're asking to accept those wounds. You're not asking to forget that they ever happened because you can't. They happened, they're real. The only way you could forget a a wound is by erasing a memory. If you don't remember the wound, it's not there. And so what you're really trying to do is accept the wound for what it is and live with it. And allow that wound to help you move forward and not to hold you back. Sounds easy, doesn't it? (laughs) Blimey heck, you know how tough that is. But that's why we need the Holy Spirit. That's why we need prayer ministry. That's why we need these healing services, these healing healing masses. That's why we need mass. That's why we need praying over. Not because we're trying to forget the wounds. Not not because we're trying to let go of the the damage that it's done. (coughs) We, We certainly want help and healing from the damage that it's done. But we need the strength to be able to accept the wound and help that, get that wound to really lead us forward and help other people with their wounds. Our wounds should be helping other people with theirs. But most of the time, our wounds hurt other people. We inflict them on others. And so if I've been wounded and maybe somebody once said something or did something to me, how easy is it for me to take that on, out on somebody else? Or parents with their kids. Parents get wounded by the kids and kids get wounded by the parents. And when they live together, they use it against each other. When they don't, instead of using the wounds to help the children. But it's hard because the children know how to pick at those wounds. And parents do and friends do. We all do. We know how to pick at those wounds. But I think as well... Satan knows how to pick at those wounds and sometimes somebody will say something to me out of nowhere and it'll be so precise I'll flare up and I'll feel it and and you know what I'm talking about and all of a sudden I'll say something and it'll lead to an argument I walk away completely guilty and I wonder how did that even happen and then I think it had to have been the devil it had to it was just too precise that person didn't know and all of a sudden just came out with it and it's like Ugh. here's an example my brother who just knows my wounds yesterday I thought we're going to have a peaceful day nice and quiet and he came over and he sat down and out of nowhere he just said I believe in reincarnation and that was it <laughs> I wanted to kill him <laughs> and I didn't want him to come back <laughs> oh what a wound but it's, it's amazing how sometimes that can happen. People can know your wounds. And it's, I guess, it's bringing them to, to God. It's bringing them to the Mass. It's when the priest lifts up the host and says, the body and blood of Christ, it's given those wounds along with the body and blood of Christ. It's along with the, the Mass, offering those wounds up. But you can't ignore your wounds. Somebody once said, Never ignore, never drown your problems because they always float to the top. <laughs> Very true, isn't it? Never drown your problems because they always float to your top. And that's the problem as well with, the, with the distraction from prayer. When we don't want to pray, when we're distracting ourselves, really, we're ignoring our wounds. Because in prayer, they start to float to the top. In prayer, that's when we realise what we're struggling with. And we kind of might have that little fight to actually sit in silence but it's then that we can actually give our wounds to God and Jesus said that we have to be salt of the world which means sometimes because you're salt and you're entering into my wounds it's going to hurt but the salt we're called to be is love that's the flavour that's the taste but if salt loses its saltiness it's useless throw it away and so as soldiers for Christ with now the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gifts that the Holy Spirit brings along, we should be able to recognise our own wounds. Because I was thinking about the other day how you see two types of whip in the Bible. There's the whip where Jesus is in the temple and he's cleansing the temple 
And so that's a good whip. That's almost like the whip that God uses us to cleanse us. It's like a whip of humility. But then you see another whip by the Roman soldiers using against Jesus. And that's not a good whip. Because that's there to destroy Jesus. And so that's from the devil. And so there are two whips. And sometimes you can be in a conversation and you feel like you're being whipped by someone. By what they say. It's as though they feel the need to humble you. They have the right to tell you your faults or your failings. They just feel like you're being too proud and they need to tell you how it is to break you down. And that really, I would say, comes from the devil. And the reason why is because St. Paul tells us to build one another up. We don't destroy anybody. If anybody is going to humble anybody, it's not going to be us doing it. It's going to be God doing it. So if you see anyone filled with pride, the best thing to do is pray for that person. It's too easy to think, I need to break that person's pride. I need to say something or do something. Because you don't know what damage you can do in the process. Whereas you pray, God knows exactly how to do it. Pray for the humility of that person. Step back and watch what God does. It's fascinating. And so you have the whip that builds, which is God. Or you have the whip that destroys, which is from the devil. And the difference, I think, is that when we try and whip someone into humility, all we do is destroy them. But when God whips us into humility, he builds us up simultaneously. So it's a stripping, but it's also a building immediately. So when you are humbled by God, you know it, you feel it, but you also feel built up in some way as well. But when somebody else whips you with the mouth, tells you off, tells you you're, you're this or you're that, you, you don't feel built up. It takes away your peace, but with God. This is my own experience. Does anybody else have this experience? Yeah. I know, I used to whip people all the time. <laughs> that was the problem of going to places like Steubenville. You learn all this theology, so it makes you self-righteous. So when somebody says something, whoosh, Indiana Jones, you only learn it the hard way. And the hard way is when God lets it happen to you and then you feel it and you think, wow, I'm actually doing this to people and they're doing it to me. Or when you see people doing it to each other, you can see them destroying each other. Um, But then I've I've, I've been in the situation where I thought, right, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to pray for that person. I'm going to step back. I'm going to see what God does. And boy, do you see them being humbled. But you see them being built up at the same time. Completely different. It's, It's beautiful to watch. So... Two different types of whip. The cleansing and the destroying. And elsewhere St. Paul says that the, the devil is like a prowling lion. He never sleeps. We get tired. And when we get tired, that's when we're vulnerable. You notice in the temptations of Jesus, when did the devil come and get him? When he was hungry. After 40 days of fasting, it says he was hungry and the devil came to tempt him. He went after him when he was at his weakest. He didn't come at him in the middle or at the beginning when he was strong. He waited for when he was tired. So a good lesson there is when you're tired, sleep. (laughs) Rest. Eat well. Get some good sleep. Take care of yourself. Because if you don't, then that's all going to be used against you. And you know it is because when you're tired, you're moody. Okay, when we're tired, we're moody. (laughs) When we're tired, it usually brings out the worst in us. Unless unless you're doing it as a fast, then it's different. Because then you you are alert. Notice when you're fasting, you're more alert because you expect to be irritable. You'd expect to to react. So you don't because you're alert. But when tired creeps up, tiredness creeps up on you, all of a sudden you don't expect it. And all of a sudden, you're doing a thousand things. You're not praying anymore. You're distracted. All of a sudden, your prayer life has gone out the window and you're at your weakest and you're tired. And then all of a sudden, you wonder what's going wrong. And then you're told, there's a healing mass next Monday. So everybody just flocks. And it's great that we have the healing masses, but we have to do our part as well. We can't just turn up expecting everything to be done for us. And then we don't have to do anything now until next month. We have to do our part. We come to get strength. And then we have to try and keep strong when we leave. I was reading about Ignatian spirituality last week. And he talks about discernment of spirits. You know, there's Ignatian retreats that you go on. Some are longer than others. And it's this whole discernment of spirits along the way. And I read that 
The difference between when God speaks to you and when the devil speaks to you is the devil gets into your imagination and your sensation. That's when you know it's the devil. But when it's God, he speaks to you through your conscience and through your reason. And the church teaches us that we need faith and reason. And so that's why you have to, I guess, you know, really listen to, is this my imagination leading me? Am I taking everything out of proportion? <coughs> I'm reasoning your way through it. And really listen, to what is your conscience saying? Because many times we follow not just our imagination, but the feelings that come with the imagination, which is the sensation part. It feels good, so we do it, or we follow it, and we're driven by it, and we think it might be God. Well, the Canadian spirituality tells us, step back, think about it, reason through it, and listen to your conscience. And I say that because we just mentioned right judgment, and I thought that was really interesting. Mm. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 